Welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Collaborative at the Bedrosian Center here at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. And with me are Aubrey Hicks and Ann Johnson, also part of the Bedrosian Center. Uh, we have a symposium today on the topic of slavery and its legacies. The symposium will be made up of six academic papers uh, broken into three panels. So two papers each panel. Uh, each panel will go about 75 minutes with 15 minutes between panels. That'll give us a time, little time to, to break or if we end up going a little bit long, we'll have that as a buffer. Uh, presenters are asked to speak about 20 minutes on their papers with discussions to go about seven to 10 minutes on each paper. That should leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end, as well as some back and forth, uh, potentially between uh, the authors and the discussants. Uh, we'll begin now at 9 a.m. If everything stays to form, we should finish about 1.15 p.m. today. So without further ado, I am going to give you the first paper uh, by Jason Paulus, Amnesty Policy and Elite Persistence in the Postbellum South, Evidence from a Regression Discontinuity Design. Jason. Hey, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to Jeff and the conference organizers. I'm very excited for this workshop. Um, so my name is Jason Poulos. I'm a postdoc at Duke and SAMC. Uh, and I started this uh, research when I was a uh, PhD student at UC Berkeley in the political science department. Um, and so as Jeff said, I'm presenting on amnesty policy and elite persistence. Um, I have here the GitHub link. Um, it has both the code and the data for this project, and I hope people uh, use both. So the central question motivating this paper is um, this crucial question posed by Hackney in 1972. And the question is of continuity or discontinuity in the identity of the Southern elite across the Civil War and Reconstruction. And <clears throat> what Hackney and also uh, Woodward and others um, in this era were mostly concerned about was uh, the identity of uh, the political elite um, in the South um, uh, after Reconstruction. And the central question is, is essentially uh, whether the, the planter class uh, uh, maintained its status after the Civil War Reconstruction or whether the um, planter class stumbled and uh, other opportunities um, were presented um, outside of the planter class for um, political mobility. And so the conclusion from Woodward uh, is that the planter class actually did not regain its power during this period. And instead, uh, urban professionals and former Whigs uh, were able to basically capture uh, the Democratic Party, um, the dominant strain of the Democratic Party during this time. Um, and these urban professionals uh, were aligned against uh, with the economic interests of capital in the Northeast and were essentially opposed to local uh, farming interests. And <clears throat> uh, so Woodward and all uh, focused mostly on qualitative type of research and um, this uh, discontinuity point of view is buttressed by these like small N case studies in which, um, for instance, Cooper in 2005 looked at um, legislators in South Carolina and looked at their occupational statuses and noticed that um, the majority of legislators um, pre-war were farmers or planters. And po in the post-war period, um, the majority were lawyers. So this is um, kind of uh, evidencing the idea that the political elite um, faced um, a discontinuity. Another dimension of this question is uh, the identity of the economic elites uh, before and after Civil War Reconstruction. Um, and the kind of mainstream view is posed by Alston Ferry in 1999. And they argue that there was actually little turnover um, in the planter class uh, before and after Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, and so <clears throat> there are studies that look at um, uh, 
small portions of the census data. Um, for instance, uh, Weiner in 1976 uh, noticed that 43% um, of the wealthiest farmers in 1860 uh, remained wealthy uh, a decade later, um, so after Civil War and Reconstruction. And this is not much different than the, the pre-war persistence rate um, comparing whether the wealthy maintained being wealthy between 1850 and 1860. Um, and so there are more recent studies, for instance, DuPont and Rosenblum 2016 and Ader et al. 2019, um, that were able to utilize uh, the full count census of 1860 and 1870, 1860 and 1870. Um, and so they actually noticed um, substantially more turnover in um, the wealthy households in the South compared to the North uh, between 1860 and 1870. Um, so that's across the Civil War and the start of Reconstruction. However, they also point out they link um, uh, slaveholding parents to sons. And they notice that a lot of the economic uh, loss that was experienced by the planter class during this um, period were, was actually uh, recovered by uh, later generations. Um, so this is kind of mixed evidence, but it kind of point, the mainstream view I still think is pointing to uh, continuity in the economic elite across the Civil War and Reconstruction. So my paper is uh, looking at a specific aspect of Reconstruction and that's uh, presidential amnesty policy. And I'm principally interested in the role of uh, amnesty policy on um, the economic status and political status of elites. And the particular policy I'm looking at is this Proclamation 134, granting amnesty to participants in the rebellion with certain exceptions. And this is um, an executive order by President Johnson signed in 1865. And this order is notable because it granted, it was the first uh, presidential order to grant uh, amnesty to all Confederates um, in exchange for taking an amnesty oath. Uh, however, it excluded a substantial portion of, um, of Southerners from amnesty. And um, there are 14 classes of exclusions, but the biggest among those 14 classes uh, were those with taxable, taxable property, um, at least $20,000 or more. And so these people with, um, these, these were the targeted economic elite, these people holding $20,000 or more in taxable property, and they were excluded from amnesty. Um, and then they also had an option to apply for a presidential pardon. Um, and I'll get into that more later. Um, uh, so these people excluded from amnesty uh, could not vote or hold public office for three years. Um, this is important because they were essentially excluded from political life for three years. Um, and moreover, they could not reclaim or um, they were denied property rights and couldn't re reclaim property um, that was confiscated during the Civil War. So just to show like a chronology of events here. Um, so this is the presidential proclamation of interest, the one that excluded um, uh, individuals with $20,000 or more um, in taxable property. Um, the first uh, amnesty proclamation was by uh, Lincoln in 1863. And this is notable because um, <clears throat> it excluded uh, like uh, Confederate generals and, and um, higher ups in the Confederate army. Um, so, and this was uh, several years before Congress passed the first Reconstruction Act, um, basically laying out the conditions for Southern governments um, to re-enter re the Union. Um, and one of the conditions uh, for re-entering re uh, the Union was they had to, uh, the Southern governments had to pass a new constitution um, that essentially uh, protected the rights of uh, former slaves. Um, and so notable uh, to this study, which uses data from um, these reconstruction conventions, was that 
so the reconstruction conventions started uh, shortly after the first reconstruction act and they were um, tasked with the uh, with uh, with um, signing these new um, constitutions and so in 1868 um, Johnson passed the last amnesty um, executive order which essentially uh, granted amnesty to all Southerners. Um, so the, the, the study period that I'm interested in uh, basically extends from 1865 to 1868. Uh, I included the dates of the 1870 census here and 1860 census because that's where we get um, our data on wealth. And so as you can imagine, um, this $20,000 $20, exception um, motivates the use of this regression discontinuity framework um, that a lot of people are probably aware, uh, familiar with in the context of uh, close elections. Uh, but here I'm, I'm using uh, census wealth as the, the running variable. And so what we're interested in doing here is comparing uh, individuals um, just below and above this $20,000 threshold. And the $20,000 threshold uh, determines treatment, which I define here as being excluded from amnesty. Uh, so the treated individuals are those um, with $20,000 or more, um, and they're not allowed um, um, the rights of those with amnesty. Uh, and so the key idea for the RD framework is um, that individuals below and above the, the, the threshold are going to be very similar um, on all other observable uh, measures other than um, their census wealth. And there's just gonna be the small difference um, in the census wealth between those below and above. So um, it's kind of like forming a, a, a little random, randomized experiment um, just in the proximity of this $20,000 threshold. And the estimate of interest is the treatment effect on treated compliers. So these are people uh, above the $20,000 threshold uh, who didn't apply for this presidential pardon. And I'll explain the pardon data uh, later, but essentially anyone who applied for the pardon um, uh, got it. So, so the compliers I'm defining as those who, who never applied. So the data used in this study is um, the most important thing here is the 1860 census wealth. So the census contains uh, both real estate wealth and personal estate wealth. Uh, which I combined to form a total census wealth. And so this is the running uh, variable for the RD experiment. Uh, and census wealth is very commonly used in the HPE uh, literature. Um, and there are studies, for instance, this one by Steckel in 1994, uh, which uh, quantitatively show that census wealth is comparable um, to locally assessed uh, taxable property wealth. Um, so in reality, uh, the wealth data is used to determine who's $20,000 um, um, for the purpose of um, amnesty exclusion uh, is kind of a mystery, but um, there's some indication that it's based on uh, this locally assessed taxable property. So the, um, the property assessed by county commissioners. Um, uh, but this is... Um, the 1860 census wealth can then therefore be seen as a, a proxy for this um, um, locally assessed taxable property. So I create a sample of 1860 slaveholders um, in the following steps. So first I have access to the 100% 1860 census data. Uh, so this is data that was um, created uh, in partnership um, with um, uh, like family websites um, for the purpose of uh, family search. Um, and so it has information on like names, uh, uh, state and uh, town of residence. Um, it does not have the census wealth um, um, transcript, tr uh, transcribed. So the first step I do is I link this 100% um, uh, census. And so there's about a little, uh, a million and a quarter adult white Southerners in uh, the sample. And I link that to the 5% sample of the 1860 slave census, uh, which is comprised of 14,000 uh, 14, slaveholders. 
Um, and I'm just doing this because I want a, a sample of, uh, of those uh, most likely to uh, be near the $20,000 uh, threshold. And I'm able to match almost everyone uh, because all the slaveholders in the 1860 slave census are in this full count census. Um, and then I wanna know how uh, these uh, slaveholders do in terms of their future wealth. So I then uh, link the matches to the 100% 1870 census. And it yields a match rate of about under 20%, um, which is very low, but it's also consistent with um, similar studies that do the same thing. And so this yields um, a sample of about 5,000 slaveholders. And so I focus on the slaveholders living in the um, four deep south states, um, including Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Um, and I have a, a I had a team of undergraduate uh, research assistants uh, transcribing the census wealth uh, for these individuals. I have a second sample of Reconstruction um, Convention delegates that I pulled from the book by Human Go 2008. Um, and they did a, a great job essentially doing all the work for me. Um, and so these Reconstruction uh, Conventions, as I mentioned, were held in all uh, Confederate states except for Tennessee, which had like an early readmittance to the Union. Um, and their task was adopting this new constitution. And so among this sample, uh, about half were slaveholders, a quarter were former office holders, uh, and 12% uh, were unionists. So there's some evidence, uh, descriptive evidence, that um, the Reconstruction delegates were a mix of former slaveholders and kind of like the new professional class of lawyers um, and speculators and other property holders um, that kind of reasserted itself uh, during uh, Reconstruction. And so to determine um, compliance, I have um, pardon records. So these are records of uh, presidential pardons granted by Johnson as of May 1866. And uh, the way I get this is Congress actually asked uh, Johnson around the state um, to supply the names of individuals who applied for a pardon. Um, so this is data directly from the congressional record. Um, <clears throat> and so using this data, I determined that about 11% of the 1860 slaveholder sample and 7% of the Reconstruction uh, delegates um, that uh, had $20,000 or more um, applied for a pardon. And here I'm assuming that everyone who applied for a pardon received one because there um, is qualitative evidence pointing to the fact that everyone who applied received one. So here I'm just uh, comparing the uh, census uh, wealth of both samples. Um, so in the red is the 1860 slaveholders and in the teal is the reconstruction delegates. And I guess what's interesting here is that um, the distributions are like pretty similar. Um, you can see that the 1860 slaveholders hold more in personal property value um, than the reconstruction delegates. And that could be attributed to the fact that, um, so the personal property value includes the value of slaves. So it's uh, not surprising that the slaveholders um, would hold more in personal property value than the reconstruction delegates, only half, and only half of these reconstruction delegates were um, slaveholders in 1860. And so just comparing the rate, the percentage of, of, of the sample that was in this $20,000 class that, were, that was excluded from amnesty. Um, 1860 slaveholders, about a quarter of the sample were in this class and uh, about 23% of the reconstruction uh, delegates were in this excluded class. And <clears throat> here, I just wanna compare those two rates um, to other sources of information. 
Um, so for instance, we can deduce from the 1% the sample, the 1860 census, uh, which is fully transcribed, we can up, uh, up expand this 1% uh, sample um, using population weights and determine that about 13% of all adult Southern males um, in, the, in 1860 uh, would have been um, excluded. Um, so that kind of makes sense that that figure would be lower than a quarter um, since uh, slaveholders are going to be on average wealthier than um, the typical adult Southern male. And <clears throat> there are some study, qualitative studies in, this, in older literature that um, um, <clears throat> estimate between five to 10% of either all Southern males or uh, males living in Georgia uh, were excluded under these rules. Before presenting the esti uh, estimates from the regression discontinuity uh, experiment, um, a common way of assessing um, the, the valid validity of our assumption that those um, right above the $20,000 threshold are very similar to those below the $20,000 threshold, uh, we can look at um, the continuity of observable covariates. And so what this plot is, is um, taking all the observable pretreatment covariates available in each sample, um, you know, such as age, um, and using that as the outcome variable for the RD experiment. We should hope if our assumption holds that uh, people below and above the threshold are similar, um, these should be uh, null findings for each outcome. And so indeed we do find that for all the available um, pretreatment covariates, um, we have no results on all of them. So that's, uh, it's good for, in terms of our assumption. And so, we have pretreatment covariates on uh, occupations. Um, and in the delegate data, it's a little bit more rich because the authors um, do like uh, background checks on each delegate. So they're able to find, you know, if they're uh, former Confederates or former Democrats, whether they old held office in the past. Um, whereas in the slaveholder sample, we just have, um, the information that was provided in the 1860 census. Okay, so here are the estimates on the reconstruction delegates. On the left hand side here, I have estimates on uh, binary outcomes. So uh, whether the delegate held office in the future, uh, whether they protested adopting uh, the constitution during the convention and um, this Republican support score which um, is a measure of their support uh, during the convention on issues um, supporting that are in favor of republicanism. Um, so this is a measure that was um, created by um, Human Go. Um, <clears throat> and so what we see is actually a, a negative treatment effect um, on um, the outcome of ex post office holding. Um, so you can interpret that as saying, being excluded from amnesty um, or being in the $20,000 class actually uh, decreased the probability that these reconstruction delegates uh, would um, become an office holder in the future. And so uh, this has both the in intention to treat estimate, uh, which is just uh, the effect of, of being, uh, being in the $20,000 class. And I also estimate the, the effect of treatment on the treated, which is just the ITT estimate um, scaled by the uh, compliance rate. And so the, the compliance, um, non-compliance would actually uh, dilute the ITT effect. Um, so the effect on the actual, on the people who were excluded who never applied for uh, a pardon is actually uh, a little um, 
um, the effect is a little larger in magnitude. I'm interested whether being excluded from amnesty impacts future wealth. Um, and so uh, these outcome variables are 18 cent 1870 census wealth. So these are, uh, this is the wealth of delegates uh, measured um, uh, like five years after the, or a couple of years after the, the conventions. Uh, and I find, um, you know, all the point estimates are positive, but uh, uh, the, the coverage includes zero. So these are um, null findings on census wealth. So on the <clears throat> sample of 1860 slaveholders, um, I don't have um, an equivalent measure of ex post office holding, but I do have um, uh, the measures on 1870s census wealth. So this is, um, so the sample, uh, the sample was about 5,000, uh, over 5,000 people and about, we had a 20% match rate um, to the 1870s cen census. Um, so this is a sample of about 1,600 uh, people who were found in slaveholders who were in both the 1860 and 1870 census. Um, and it's kind of nice that similar to the reconstruction um, delegates where we have point estimates around uh, 10,000, we find something similar on the 1860 slaveholders uh, sample, but uh, similarly, these uh, covered um, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty intervals uh, contain zero, so these are uh, null findings as well. So uh, just to conclude and um, discuss these findings. Um, so the findings of the paper point to both uh, continuity of economic mobility and discontinuity of political mobility for the Southern elites. Um, so the discontinuity of political mobility is from this finding that uh, reconstruction delegates were about 80% less likely to hold office in the future. Um, those who were uh, assigned to, to treatment, in this case, being excluded from amnesty. And so one possible mechanism for this negative effect um, is losing connections in political networks. So they were uh, individuals in, this, in the $20,000 class were excluded from political life for three years. Um, so we would kind of expect them to lose uh, you know, valuable connections um, in politics. Um, and so, Future work might, might examine um, heterogeneous treatment effects in terms of, for instance, whether um, these delegates held office in the past. And so we, might, have, we might suspect that um, uh, former office holders um, would have uh, you know, more substantial uh, connections to political networks and being um, kind of removed from those political networks for three years due to uh, not receiving amnesty um, might have this deleterious effect on future uh, office holding. The evidence toward continuity of economic mobility. Um, <clears throat> so this basically means that the 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 plant the um, the economic elites kind of lost ground during this period, um, and the find the null findings on future census wealth for 1860 slaveholders, I argue, is at least consistent with this idea of, uh, of continuity. Um, and it's unlikely that the, it's unlikely that these uh, null findings are due to lack of statistical power. Um, in the paper, I conduct power analyses and I show that um, at least with a sample of this size, um, uh, treatment effect estimate of about $20,000 uh, would, would be sufficient, um, um, would be sufficient enough to have a, uh, a significant effect attached to it. Um, and so uh, together, I think uh, the evidence towards continuity and discontinuity is kind of in line with this idea of the iron law of oligarchy that's proposed by a small blue and Robinson. And essentially this idea is um, the old boss the same as the new boss. Um, so the economic institutions um, um, can persist irrespective of the identity of the elites. 
Um, so, and this kind of explains how we can see a slavery that's a system that's based on um, chattel slavery, um, how it could be replaced by um, this repressive uh, tenant farming system. Um, despite um, the turnover in the political elite in the Democratic Party at this time. Um, this is kind of reminds me of um, this argument made by Woodward um, that some of the members of the planter class actually transform themselves into like the new professional class um, that kind of took over the Democratic Party at this time. Um, so, so in conclusion, I, I, I leave you with this idea that, um, you know, the identity of the political elites can change um, and that really has no bearing on the persistence of economic institutions. Um, and that is all. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so the second paper will be uh, a trio of uh, folks from NYU. Uh, Mario Chacon, Jeff Jensen, and Sudeke Nitsu. Uh, and Jeff will be the presenter today. First, thanks uh, to, to Jeff for organizing this. It's very exciting to be a part of this. And um, also thanks to uh, the discussant, David, I, who I apologize for, for the sort of unpolished state of the, the version you saw. So, uh, but thank you in advance. So uh, our, our uh, project here is uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the case of, of uh, enforced enfranchisement uh, during reconstruction and uh, what actually drove uh, effective black polit political uh, participation during this period. Okay, so um, this this period is uh, what is kind of motivating this, this symposium is that this period is quite important. Uh, the failure of Reconstruction, you know, ultimately led to uh, racial segregation, it's, you know, systematic uh, racial segregation, and uh, the contemporary unequal status of African Americans. So, um, and Reconstruction itself is has really recently become uh, uh, very interesting to uh, social scientists. Uh, there's a lot of papers recently, in particular, approaching this um, from this historical political economy approach uh, and thinking about this in terms of post-conflict settings, uh, democratization in post-conflict settings, and especially in a setting with extremely high group-based inequality. Uh, in many of these studies, they've, they've approached this from a lot of different uh, angles, uh, such as uh, investments in, in, uh, in capacity, like the Freedman Bureau, the paper by Rogowski, uh, things like the uh, elite planter, poor whites political coalitions that form to, uh, to, uh, to end uh, reconstruction. Um, and we're going to look at this from uh, uh, the, the perspective of uh, the effect of federal level enforcement and how that played in the electoral success of black politicians during reconstruction. And in particular, we're looking at the, the consequences of the uh, congr congressional reconstruction, the decision of Congress to, to use the US Army to uh, occupy the South, register uh, uh, the former slaves to, to vote and uh, ultimately protect them in exercising their political rights. Why is this of, uh, uh, of interest to, to us in this emerging uh, field? So uh, there's quite now quite a large literature in, in uh, comparative politics, economics, um, and other fields showing that the, the personal attributes of, pol of politicians uh, matter for, their, for policy outcomes. So the gender of the politician, the race of the politician, et cetera. At the same time, uh, scholars have argued and shown that uh, in, in periods of democratization, that um, elites will, will uh, respond to changes in de jour um, political power with uh, uh, essentially use of, increased use of things like violence, 
in coercion to offset these changes, uh, which is obviously what we saw during the period of re reconstruction. And at the same time, uh, there have been there have been papers that have shown that the enforcement of political rights has been shown to be important for Black political representation in contemporary times. So a lot of work on the the the, the consequences of, of, of various provisions in the Voting Rights Act, for, for instance. So uh, uh, the previous panelists discussed some of these, uh, the features that I'm gonna mention here, um, but there's a, a couple key uh, features that I wanna highlight uh, from the period of congressional reconstruction. So uh, as the previous panels mentioned, uh, as the price of readmission to Congress of the former Confederate States, um, one of the prices was complete uh, enfranchisement of, of, uh, the, uh, of all black adult males. Um, the army was charged with registering uh, people to vote. And in the list that they made uh, before these reconstruction conventions, one in each state, again, the panelists mentioned this before, uh, where they were gonna rewrite the state constitutions. Uh, the, the data on the, um, Registered voters show that um, uh, the blacks comprised 45% uh, or more of the registered voters in eight of the 10 reconstruction states and 50% or more in five. So this is a, just an enormous change in the electorate of these states. Um, at the local level, the, the, uh, the change in du jour uh, the electorate uh, was proportional to the, essentially the uh, slave population, the enslaved population in 1860. But uh, the army was charged with registering voters and protecting them, but the occupation force that was provided by Congress was essentially insufficient. It was way too small to protect um, these new voters because the, the distribution of, uh, of, of black voters across the South is largely agricultural, the South is extremely large. And so uh, large swaths of the South did not really, um, the, the, the US Army did not really reach, at least they were not in close proximity to um, US Army troops. Another factor is that the, the occupation force was made up almost entirely of infantry. So the force that was charged was infantry, most of the cavalry troops that were used during the war were, were shipped out West. And so the, uh, the ability of the infantry to respond to violence and move to different spots is obviously much more limited in this period. So, so the key here is that the occupation force was never large enough uh, to protect all these new voters. And it shrank, also I forgot to mention, is it shrank substantially over the course of reconstruction. So Congress didn't fund it and then they were shrinking it due to essentially uh, fiscal pressures due to the large war debt, but also the changing national landscape where uh, Republicans were losing uh, political power over this issue. Um, so, and then as we know that by the end of reconstruction, this, this, this source of enforcement was completely removed. So at the end of reconstruction, black adult males, they retained their de jure voting rights until the imposition of uh, literacy, literacy tests and poll taxes, which largely disenfranchised um, black voters until, until, until the middle of the 20th century. All right, so these are the key features of, uh, of, that we're going to exploit to test. So our argument is that the, the presence of troops, the nearby presence of troops, these significantly raise the costs of elites and whites to, to repress these new voters and therefore lowered the costs uh, of black political mobilization. So we use the location of military outposts during reconstruction and the timing of them, which is uh, provided by a historian named Downs. And, um, and we argue that, that the nearby presence of federal troops should be observed with greater effective black political participation. And so what we are measuring in essence is the relationship between the presence of US Army troops posts and a county and the incidence of black political uh, representation. So how do we measure this effective black political participation? 
our dependent variable in all our tests is the, the county level count of black representatives in two state level legislative bodies. So the first one is delegates to these reconstruction conventions that the previous panels mentioned that were that Congress required the states to have. Each, each of the 10 states held one largely between 1867 and 1869. So they were held uh, more or less simultaneously. Uh, the same source that the previous panels used is Human Go, who provides information on each delegate. We use this as well. And through this, we know the race and partisan affiliation of all the delegates. And there was approximately a thousand of them. Our second uh, source is the, the counts of black representatives of each state's lower house. So there are two chambers in each state legislature. We use the lower chamber uh, mainly because at this time, um, people were elected out of low, lower chambers. The boundaries for the districts were just counties. And so this works very well with existing uh, census data where uh, upper house districts typically were multi-county multi districts. And it's, a, it's a bit messier. Uh, an alternative measure to this for both is we know the apportionment for each county. That is the number of delegates to the conventions and representatives to, this, to these, uh, uh, each county that they were apportioned. And we can create a ratio of black representatives or delegates to the reps, representatives or delegates apportioned to these. But most of these were single members. So in, in essence, these aren't very different and the results remain regardless of which one we use. Okay, so the first test is, uh, is cross-sectional of these, of these um, delegates elected to the Reconstruction Conventions, and we're seeing whether the presence of, of troops in a county, of basically posts in the county, uh, is correlated with the election of black delegates. Uh, approximately 23% of all the delegates elected were, were black. Uh, just a little bit very quickly about them. Um, they tended to be literate, um, free before the war, uh, and richer than average black voter at the time. Uh, we also use the fact that human, human go, they estimate the partisan affiliation of white delegates. So we can see which of the white delegates were Republicans and ultimately Democrats. So, Okay, so our baseline model is it's, it's a county level cross section across these 10 states. Uh, our baseline model includes uh, black population shares control. So that's the, that's the uh, that should be the biggest predictor of black uh, representation in, in, in these uh, conventions and total population. And then we, we do additional tests with um, population density, uh, per capita wealth, uh, land inequality, and then some other ones like the elevation of the county, uh, mean elevation of the county, because this might affect the ability of troops to effectively uh, provide uh, enforcement. So that's our baseline models. We also take an approach that, uh, that tries to uh, deal with the fact that where the troops were located is endogenous to uh, factors which could influence whether uh, black politicians are elected. So we use the railway network. Uh, this is actually a typo. I'm sorry, I should have corrected this. This is the pre-war railway network. So the 1860 railway network to construct a, a different sample that potentially balances the, the, the factors that might lead uh, to whether uh, a um, county is occupied or not. So our strategy here, is to take all the counties that have a railway line in 1860. And then we use the exact coordinates of uh, the military bases in 1867. And, and if they are within five uh, kilometers of a railway line, then this county is treated. And then we compare this to a control county, which is counties with railway lines, but do not have um, uh, military posts. And so you can see our, our, our strategy here. The dark gray are the, one, are the counties that have posts and a railway line within five kilometers of the post. So this excludes all counties without railway lines, also excludes counties with posts but no railway lines. And then the light gray are ones with railway lines but without posts. 
And that's our, we want to compare whether we're more likely to see black representatives in those controlling for black population share in these other covariates that I, that I showed you before. Uh, here are the descriptive statistics. Just very quickly, I want to show you that the occupied counties overall are more, are, have higher black share and they're richer. And you can see here that in the restricted sample, uh, we have a bit better balance across the two samples. So the black share is a little bit closer. They're, the difference in wealth isn't as great. And so this is a, a chance for us to try to compare samples that are, that are more alike. So our, here are the results for this set of tests on the convention delegates. If, the, if our main uh, coefficient is whether the county is, S, is, is occupied and, and then we essentially add covariates and then the full set of covariates are in columns three and six. One, columns one to three are black delegates and then um, four, five and six are, are uh, Republican delegates to these conventions. And we see that occupied counties are much more likely to, you know, controlling for black share and these other things, other uh, covariates, much more likely to um, uh, elect black delegates. Uh, when we when we use our our railway sample, uh, we see even stronger results. So even when we're only restricting it to counties with railway lines we again see the occupied ones are much more likely to elect black delegates controlling for these various covariates. Okay, our second test, um, for the sake of time, I lost, I'll, I'll leave out that sensitivity test there. Uh, the second test is we, instead of doing cross-sectional, we use a panel of black representatives in the lower chamber of the state legislature between 1868 and the end of Reconstruction, 1878. So uh, we create a five period panel, which corresponds to the election cycles. And then lower chamber, the lower house, there are two year cycles in all these states. So we have five cycles during Reconstruction. Uh, for this data, we combine phoners, uh, list of black politicians in, during Reconstruction, um, which is actually, quite incomplete. And then we find individual state level sources for all these other states and we, and we combine these to create a, a complete data set of, of, of black lower house representatives um, over these five election cycles across these 10 states. So here are the maps across these cycles, uh, the trends in African-American representation, black representation in, in the lower house, lower house. And you can see it's declining by cycle. Uh, second are trends in army posts, uh, our main uh, explanatory variable. And this is the occupation. You can see the occupation is much larger at the beginning and it's declining over time. Okay, so uh, for our empirical strategy here is to use a difference in difference estimator with two-way fixed effects. So fixed effects for the counties in the electoral cycle. Uh, very quickly, the idea is to control for time invariant county level factors that might affect the likelihood of occupation. Um, and most of our within county variation is coming from the removal of troops, but the uneven removal of troops from counties. So as counties essentially lose troops, that's where we're gaining our, our variation in this panel. Yet there are some counties that also do go from being unoccupied to occupied. So that's another source of variation. We include the same controls and we use three different measures of occupation. Uh, one is just a dummy variable of occupied or not, the number of army units and the average number of troops. So for instance, in this figures here, these are the number of units in, in a county. Okay, um, we do another set that, that tries to control for the fact that each state was placed in a different military districts. So we have a set of models that controls for the military districts and inter interacted with this electoral cycle. Uh, again, like the, uh, with the um, reconstruction conventions, we find strong support that the occupation uh, increased the incidence of uh, black representatives in the lower house 
We're going here from including uh, controls um, and we have and across these different measures of occupation. And again, we have strong support. The columns three, six, and nine, these include uh, uh, dummies for the different military commanders uh, that, that, uh, that oversaw the US Army in, in these districts. And again, we still see strong support for um, uh, the effect of troops on black representation. Uh, very quickly, I'll end with trying to see how the occupation interacted with a number of different factors that have been identified to influencing politics during reconstruction and influencing the, the election of, uh, of black politicians in this period. So in a recent paper by Rogowski, um, uh, looks at how the Freedmen Bureaus, which is a separate federal intervention in the South, in the post-war South, how that affected uh, uh, black outcomes. So we also collect um, the location of Freedmen Bureaus in this, in this period in the South. Uh, separately, people have argued that uh, the density of black social networks, which is and the paper by Che and Muchi, Muchi is, is proxied by um, median slave holdings. Uh, that, that they argue that that is a, a good measure of, uh, of social networks uh, in this period. Uh, in a recent paper by, by Logan, um, he argues that the, uh, candid, the supply of black politicians uh, can be predicted by the pre-war free black population. So we also look at this. And then we look at a couple other factors that we think might be influencing this. So pre-existing Southern political competition where there's more political competition, maybe we're more likely to see more black politicians in those counties. And also um, if there were early minority representation. So in this case, if there were delegates elected from the county, are we more likely to see uh, 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 more black politicians elected to lower house seats? Um, so our strategy here is to use these factors and then estimate them separately on the occupied counties and the non-occupied counties. And here's a way that we can, we portray these results. So you can see here the dark ones are the occupied counties and the, the lighter estimates are the unoccupied counties. So for instance, uh, counties with Freedmen bureaus, um, that are occupied are much more likely to elect black politicians. So this is versus unoccupied counties with Freedmen Bureau in, in the 1868 to 1870 period. Uh, here again with the median slave holdings, uh, counties that uh, are occupied with higher uh, median slave holdings are much more likely to elect black politicians to the um, uh, lower house of the state legislature compared to um, uh, unoccupied counties with higher uh, black slaveholding density. Now the one with pre-war free black share, we don't see a difference. It's very imprecisely estimated, but it seems that occupied counties are with, with higher free black share are a little bit more likely to elect uh, black politicians. And we see very little evidence for that pre-war political competition, which I should have mentioned, we measure by um, presidential vote share for the Democratic Party in 1860. And then we also try different things like gubernatorial vote share. We see very little evidence that this, um, uh, that occupation matters on this. But in general, we see that given these other um, factors that have been identified, we see that the occupation amplifies um, their effect on, on, on uh, uh, black representation in, during reconstruction. So uh, I, I wanna just quickly conclude and make a, couple, make a couple of remarks on the implications of this. So uh, first, I think we find, we find a lot of evidence that the enforcement as proxied by the presence of US troops um, 
was very critical to, uh, to black political representation during representation. And this is consistent with the argument by Downs who provided a data set on troops that uh, the failure of reconstruction was in part uh, essentially a failure to protect um, through the occupation to protect the, the recently uh, enfranchised former slaves. And I think this has implications for today uh, in light of the, the Supreme Court decision in Shelby versus Holder to weaken enforcement provisions of the VRA, which I think all of us are quite familiar with and the recent efforts to increase uh, uh, barriers uh, on minorities to vote. You see that enforcement of political rights is still uh, and especially in highly unequal societies like the U.S. is today, it remains uh, very important. Okay, uh, thank you very much, especially for your patience at the beginning, and I will stop here. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so now we'll turn it over to David Bateman. All right, so I just want to start off by uh, saying thank you to uh, Jeff for organizing this, and thank you for the authors for uh, two really wonderful papers. I really enjoyed reading them. I learned a lot from them. Um, it's one of those, it's sort of a tricky thing to uh, discuss because I find the results entirely plausible um, and sort of the results are entirely plausible. The research design is very carefully thought out. Uh, so, you know, it's not one of those situations where you can just dive into a, a gaping hole. <laughs> um, uh, the data, the new data collection that both the authors do is really also really quite remarkable. And I think that they'll provide wonderful resources and sort of uh, both in terms of the wealth collection data, as well as the uh, expanded data on office, uh, black office holding during reconstruction. I think that would be wonderfully useful. Um, and I think as you can sort of see from uh, the quote that I have here, that there, I think that the papers sort of align together very nicely, right? That the degree to which you could sustain black office holding was not unrelated to the questions of whether or not the former political elite would be reconstituted as sort of a financial or as a economic elite and so on. So I think the papers sort of pair well together. All right. So um, I'm going to start off with amnesty policy and elite persistence in the postbellum South. And the paper asks a few questions, right? What was the effect of disenfranchisement for the former Confederate elite being the critical one? And the answer is important for our characterization of the redemption in Jim Crow eras. Right? I think that there remains a lot of sort of confusion about uh, are the redeemers the same as the disenfranchisers? Are the redeemers the same as the uh, pre, pre Civil War elite? What is the sort of co composition of change in the elite across this era? And so the answer that uh, uh, this paper provides is sort of very useful for understanding what happens in the politics of that period. And it also has broader implications, or potentially has broader implications for understanding elite persistence in post-democratizing contexts more generally. Um, so as, as an example of sort of elite persistence, uh, this is Jefferson Davis, right? He, he leaves politics. Um, he doesn't sort of try and re-enter politics in a real sustained way after the Civil War. He fails at several businesses. Um, he does get back Part, part of title to lands that had been deeded by his brother to formerly enslaved men. Uh, he only really gets the lands back after uh, the judges, after a series of sort of judges are replaced, Republicans are replaced with Democrats, and then he finally wins his case. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, ask a few sort of, I'm gonna organize my comments around three questions. First is just who are these people? And by who are these people, I mean in particular the reconstruction delegates. Um, uh, so who are these people? The question in any sort of regression to continuity design is whether they're sorting around the threshold. And then finally, sort of the bigger question is what does amnesty policy tell us about change and persistence in the post bellum self or elsewhere? Um, and to sort of pair Jefferson Davis with someone else, this is Alexander Stevens, who, unlike Jefferson Davis, does re enter politics in sort of a substantial way. He's elected to Congress, refused uh, admittance. He's elected again, and eventually he's seated. He's elected governor, and he dies a reinstated plantation owner. He's sort of uh, a tricky one to think about when you think about what's the composition of the elite, given that he was a plantation owner, but he'd become wealthy as a lawyer. Uh, he is sort of one of these new class who translates his wealth uh, into something that looks a lot like the old class. All right, so who are these white reconstruction delegates? And the focus is on white reconstruction delegates. So they fall into a few categories. One are the amnestied, like the blameless and the newcomers, right? So these are northerners who move in, people who, uh, had never been sort of uh, covered by an amnesty uh, requirement and people who were amnestied. Then there's also the unamnestied, but known to be pardoned, right? So these are uh, defiers in some sense. They were, uh, they were unamnestied, so they were disenfranchised. They hadn't been uh, amnestied, covered by a blanket amnesty, but we know that they went out and sought a pardon and that they received that pardon. 
Then there is some other category of amnesties whose pardon is not known, right? The pardon counts are not perfect. Um, so, and uh, uh, the author sort of highlights this and discusses this, that the, author, the pardon counts are not perfect. So there's some quantity of people in the reconstruction conventions who were unamnestied, but who had been pardoned, but we just don't know that they were pardoned. Um, and then uh, the last are these sort of, and this is where I, I had some confusion. And so one of the things I would like from this paper generally is just a little bit more detail on, on some things. As I understood it, that there is in the reconstruction, uh, reconstruction conventions, there was some portion of members who were unamnestied because um, it was pre-pardoned. So it was sort of the pre the general amnesty for all. They hadn't been pardoned, but they had taken amnesty oaths uh, because they needed to take the amnesty oaths in order to participate in the convention. Um, they're doing so, and they're sort of an odd group, right? Because this is a convention in which one of the major outcomes, black suffrage, has been more or less predetermined, right? Uh, they have been composed to generate black suffrage, and black suffrage has been one of the requirements of these constitutions in order to be readmitted into the, into the union. So there are these white reconstruction delegates who were not amnestied, but were participating in a convention where one of the major outcomes had been predetermined, predetermined and who had not themselves applied for or at least received pardons that we know of. So the first question that was just like a little bit more sort of uh, thinking through of on the part of, on part of the author and sort of, uh, is just whether or not the very fact of their participation under these conditions suggests that these people might be different uh, than others, regardless of the covariate balance. And I was having a hard time sort of thinking through whether this would really matter about the threshold, right? So it's it gonna be that those right above 20,000 are in some way different. But I, I wanted to know the logic of why someone would, would be entering into these conventions under the conditions that they are. Um, and I was also trying to think of what would the ideal population that we'd be sampling from, what would it be? Is it, if I understand it correctly, the ideal sample that we'd be drawing from would be potential political actors. sort of those who are of the type of the age of the particular sort of social standing amongst whites that they were likely to be potential political actors. And we would prefer to have that rather than a sample of the actual political actors who were elected to the conventions. So I guess that was just uh, one initial question is what would sort of the ideal setup for this uh, design look like? Next uh, sort of set of comments involves the possibility of sorting around the cutoff value. And the cutoff value is $20,000, uh, $20,000 basically as measured in 1861. So it does seem, and uh, 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 Jason notes this that uh, it doesn't seem unlikely that you're strategically reporting your income in 1861 <laughs> with a view towards an amnesty policy several years down the road. Right? But there's other possibilities. And so I would like a little bit of detail of why $20,000. Right? Um, why was that the threshold? It might just be it was an arbitrary number. Uh, it might be we have no reason, that we have no knowledge at all of why $20,000. But, like, but just as I'm not concerned that reported census wealth was strategic, I might have some concern that it, $20,000 was chosen because of systematic differences in the types of persons above or below the threshold. Did they have counts of the census numbers? Did they have sort of uh, at least the aggregate uh, levels of census such that they can look and say, well, slave owners were much more likely to be just above 20,000 than below and those who we really want to target. I don't expect anything dramatic here, but I just want some sort of articulation of the logic for why $20,000 was, cho was chosen. The next uh, sort of question would be about the measurement of the threshold. And this is a tricky one because we have reason to suspect that census reliability varies systematically with relationship to slavery. Right? And so I, I buy that census reliability on average is going to be, uh, like that the census was a reliable estimate of a uh, recorder of wealth on average. The question though is whether it's gonna be varying with things that would also uh, relate to sort of types, particular types of systematic differences in elites. So, we have reason to expect census reliability very systematically with, uh, with enslavement. Um, and uh, the question is whether that was true in 1860, uh, whether that is true in a way that would affect the results. I was having a hard time thinking through. The other sort of closely related to that is whether or not local tax assessments might also have varied systematically. And both of these things matter in part because we're dealing here with political elites. And like, if anybody is able to get their tax assessment um, fixed, it must be political and economic elites. And so how did these tax assessments and their relationship to wealth and to uh, and the relationship to actual wealth vary across states and vary within states? Sort of an, an, another sort of question around sort of determining uh, 
whether they're sorting around the cutoff value is whether or not uh, the way that the tests, the uh, balance of treatment covariates was tested and portrayed. I initially read the paper as this being a difference in means test. And so I appreciate that that wasn't what was going on. Um, and so I initially suggested maybe uh, some different approaches and normalized differences approach or local linear regression covariates. Um, ultimately, this is sort of less my wheelhouse than it is, uh, than it is the authors. And so I, I trust them on this, but a little bit more discussion about what exactly is the, the tests uh, being done. Um, then, you know, right, if, if I wasn't entirely persuaded by the taste of it, uh, I also want more of it. And so I had like a few more things added to it. And two that come to mind was military occupations, right? Did the propensity of military occupations of being from a district that was occupied, um, did that sort of, did that very, uh, was that continuous across the threshold? As well as wealth composition, right? Wealth composition is sort of real and personal. Uh, for the most part, the paper provides us aggregates, sort of just wealth. There's some breakdown of the two um, in, uh, in the density plots, but I would like to know about whether or not that was consistent or, or was continuous at the threshold as well. Then there's this other category, um, the other accepted, right? So the other accepted from amnesty. So these are people who are still disenfranchised, uh, who were disenfranchised and not accepted from amnesty, but they weren't like their, their exception from amnesty was not related to the threshold of $20,000. And I wanted to sort of have some help thinking through what these people are. Um, are they always treats, right? They have, they're going to be treated regardless of assignment on the $20,000 uh, threshold. And so I wanted to know who these people were, what, how many there were, uh, what the logic for, uh, for this vis-a-vis -vis the regression discontinuity design was. The paper sort of suggests a few mechanisms um, by which the effects, and the major effect is the decline in the propensity to hold office after reconstruction, or to hold future office. Um, and a few possible mechanisms for this. One is the resentment, right? that I have been disenfranchised and I am now resentful of being disenfranchised and well, you take your political system and stuff it. Um, as a side note, I also was wondering sort of, what about resentful but amnesty people? who acted as though they had been disenfranchised, even though they hadn't been. Right? Do they count as always treats? These are people who are acting as though they've been treated, even though they have not been treated. Um, if the mechanism is resentment, they are acting the same way. So I wasn't entirely sure about how to think about these people. Uh, then another mechanism, and I think a mechanism that makes uh, a lot of sense to me, uh, both re resentment and reduced embeddedness make sense, but I, I found the second one a bit more compelling was reduced embeddedness in political networks. So. You're disenfranchised for three years. You are perhaps less appealing as uh, a or less useful to up and coming political actors. You lose the uh, you lose access to the networks that you had, and so on. Um, uh, the author sort of suggested he wants to do some analysis of this going forward, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, one question would be sort of how disembedded they had become. Right, they were embedded enough to be elected to a convention. Um, which also goes back to the first point about sort of what type of people are being elected to these conventions, what type of people choose to stand for these conventions. Um, and then another has to do with sort of who loses from uh, the reduced embeddedness. So if you're a very well embedded politico, um, are you more or less reliant on the continued maintenance of these networks? I imagine if you're Alexander Stevens, uh, who would sort of the vice president of the Confederacy had been a major Whig and then a major Democrat, he can handle um, losing three years of active political engagement, whereas a relatively sort of minor figure might not. So thinking through how you're gonna be able to sort of assess the importance of, or who's gonna be affected by the loss of them being embedded in political networks. All right, so what do we learn about from this paper? Uh, what do we learn about the reconstruction itself? So I think the one thing that we, I, I think a pretty, clear about is that disenfranchisement likely hastened the inevitable change in individual composition of the political elite. And there's an inevitable change here because they're gonna die. Right? So we're talking about individuals and we're, these people will eventually leave. And so at one level, the question is not whether Alexander Stevens continues in politics, but rather whether Alexander Stevens uh, continues in politics or is replaced by men from the same class, men who look exactly like Alexander Stevens. Another is whether amnesty might have facilitated the rise of a marginally different class of political actors. And this seems to be sort of the major takeaway that it, it might have done this. 
And one thing that I think what might be useful to think through is, well, what's the appropriate counterfactual? Right? The appropriate counterfactual isn't if there had been no disenfranchisement, the political class post-Reconstruction would have looked the same as it had been pre-Reconstruction. Uh, there's a lot of changes going on in the political economy of the South at the time, including the move from sort of like rights terms, labor lords, to landlords, right? There's a lot of possible changes that are going to make the elite class look slightly different, at, the, at least somewhat different. So I think the counterfactual is if no disenfranchisement, would the political class have post-Reconstruction have looked the same as with disenfranchisement? Um, and so I just, so in that case, like how important could amnesty have been um, well, given this, the relative uh, size of it or disenfranchisement given the relatively small size of it. Um, and then the last conclusion, the last thing I think we can learn from this paper is that amnesty or disenfranchisement probably didn't have much effect on elite persistence in economic status. And I think that this is pretty compelling. There was sort of no reason to doubt that. And I think the author's findings there are really quite uh, persuasive. I still can't decide if I find this surprising. Um, and so I'm sort of still thinking through this. On the one hand, elite persistence should never be surprising. But disenfranchisement was pretty severe, or it looked to have the capacity to be pretty severe. You lose property rights, you can't reclaim land. Um, still, Jefferson Davis is able to reclaim his land. Uh, Jefferson Davis, or was not even his land, Jefferson Davis is able to reclaim land. Right? The fact that it was only in place for a few years suggests that maybe it wasn't even though it potentially had teeth, maybe we shouldn't expect that much of a finding. Maybe we shouldn't expect that much of an effect in the first place. Overall though, I think the paper is extremely careful. Uh, it's very thought through and more, mostly what I would like is just a little bit more detail on some of the choices and the logics behind it. Um, and finally, um, and I don't think that this is a weakness of the paper. Uh, I think that I like that it's rooted in a particular place, but I was wondering what else this looks like. On the one hand, I could think denazification, debathification, um, but I would like to have a sense of, and this is not necessarily uh, something the author needs to pursue, but if it's going to be speaking to these broader questions, then it would be nice to know how often does something like disenfranchisement happen post-democratization, right? The usual sort of democratization, as I understand it, is they lose the influence that they had over votes, over in a particular sort of institutions, but they themselves are not stripped of rights. Um, sometimes that'll be not true, and sometimes it will be. So how often is it that they are? The next paper, Representation in Post-Democratization, I also thought was an excellent paper. So it speaks to a vitally important question. Um, and I, again, found largely compelling. Um, and so the question uh, is, was Black representation sustained by federal authority, right? And this is how I, uh, I interpret the question. The federal authority here being through the mechanism of the U.S. Army. My read of, of most historical accounts suggests it was uh, that I don't think it's sort of news that the Army mattered for Black uh, enfranchisement and black representation, but I don't think the relationship has ever been causally demonstrated. And I don't think it's been demonstrated at the level of geographic uh, sort of geographic differences. And so one of the major contributions of this paper is just to show that it did map onto spatial variation in army deployments, uh, black representation did map onto it, and that the relationship is likely causal. Um, they also sort of want to draw some potential ramifications today insofar as democratization was similarly imposed after 1965. And I think that's a useful way to go. Um, Obviously there's massive difference, especially the distinction between sort of a more bureaucratized and institutionalized set of interventions versus uh, the always sort of ad hoc deployment of the army. Um, but I think that's sort of a nice place to end it on. All right, so I'm gonna organize my, my comments for this paper around a few, just three questions as well, or three points. And one is simply about how we should think about the army bases and railways. I sort of had a hard time at times thinking through the logic of these. I mean, I just like a little bit more detail. Another and the sort of the general theme of, of my comments uh, is I'd like a little bit more detail on some of the decisions behind things such as occupation or deployment decisions, right? What was the logic at the level of sort of the army brass making these choices? I have a few questions about sort of the mechanisms and the instrumental variable that the authors use. And then I'll sort of uh, sum it up by asking what do we learn? All right, so, but I'd like to start with two very minor points. Um, and one is the title. <laughs> Uh, was democratization or imposed or sustained and upheld? And I kind of think that, it, well, it was obviously both. Imposed has sort of an odd Dunning-esque quality to it. And more important, I think it suggests a very different timeline. Most of the analysis is not about the imposition of democratization, but rather about declining support given to local actors and sustaining democratization. So it's about upholding a democratization that has been undertaken, uh, upholding and entrenching, embedding, uh, consolidating or not, rather than imposition. 
Uh, that's like a tiny point. Um, another that I think that could just be made a little bit more forcefully um, is that there's a lot of confusion, uh, and I don't think in this paper, but there's a lot of confusion generally about when the military presence ended um, in the South. And one of the things that this paper does nicely is highlight that it had been declining for a long time, like basically since 1868 or since uh, 1870, it declines quite precipitously. So by 1876, there's not much there in the first place. We've also known for a while that the sort of the presidency for withdrawal of troops trade doesn't really happen. Um, the troops had mostly already been removed. Specific decisions in 1876, the specific trade were returned to barracks. Right? It was not, we're taking you out of South Carolina, but we're taking you off the streets and into barracks. Um, that there were sort of pre-election reductions as well as post-election reductions. And these were largely dictated by military needs elsewhere, which I think sort of speaks to the possibility of, uh, or speaks to uh, questions about the instrumental variable. Um, and then one sort of quick question uh, or a quick suggestion would be whether or not you can leverage the fact that the army did a lot of things, and most of the, what the army did was not concerned with protecting voting rights, but was sort of uh, acting as collector of internal revenue <laughs> um, as a posse in the same sort of way to protect internal revenue agents. And so this might provide an opportunity for sort of like a, a counterfactual test, but uh, we can talk about that later. All right, so army base siting and zones of influence. I was a little bit confused about the zones of influence measure. Uh, some of this was cleared up in the presentation, but it wasn't fully clear in the paper. So you had to have a rail line in the country, and this line had to be five miles from, miles from an army base. So my initial question was, how many counties were within five miles but didn't have their own army base? How many had their own base but were not within five miles of rail? And those, as I understand it, are excluded. Um, so that makes sense, and uh, it could be a little bit clearer, I think. Um, and then the other question was just sort of in how it's described. Like, my understanding about the measure was that it was uh, an effort to deal with the potential endogeneity in army-based siting. Um, at times, however, it sort of it reads a little bit like it's about the projection of force, right? That it's not simply that it was, you're comparing, you're trying to sort of uh, deal with the endogeneity problem, locating army bases are very likely to be next to railroads, but that the fact that an army base is ne located next to a railroad allows the military there to project force more broadly than it otherwise would. and. I don't think this is a major issue, although uh, the zones of influence makes it sound a little bit like the latter. Um, although, but that sort of is a bit in tension with your repeated sort of recognition of that it took a long time for the infantry to walk everywhere. <laughs> um, and it sort of does read a little bit uneasily with the Sutfa discussion in the appendix, uh, insofar as the Sutfa discussion at least partially rests on the implausibility of the infantry being able to march places, uh, a projection of force in which they're close to a railway, they don't need to march very far. Um, might undermine that a little bit, or at least is somewhat in tension with it. Um, and then final, or uh, sort of about this, the, the final question I have is just a little bit more detail about the logic of the siting decisions. So I could imagine it being uh, all sorts of things, pre-war installations, you take those back, right? You take Fort Sumter, um, newly discovered strategic value, right? Things have changed a lot. Um, the international geopolitical context has changed. You might decide that certain things are now strategic that weren't before accessibility, right? Just this is, the, I think the railway is, is sort of a nice point here. You situate them where it's accessible. And then there's the uh, disturbances to the peace. You, you situate them where there was KKK activity or where there's sort of ongoing insurrections. And one possibility that I'll come back to is whether this last one creates a danger of endogeneity. Um, and so I would like a little bit more detailing of the logic of citing decisions. I would also like a little bit more detail about uh, the deployment of, of the army, not in the sense of sort of citing decision, but like actual, the, the army is brought out of the barracks and used uh, to protect a particular election or to protect some other civil right. Um, and my understanding was that the army couldn't deploy on its own authority, but it needed to be mobilized as a posse by the US Marshal or a lawful authority. And I could be totally mistaken about that. Um, the assumption in the paper is that the supply of the army is sort of sufficient. Uh, in a sense that like, if you have the army, then you should be able to have the effect of having the army. Whereas if it's, you know, you might also require the, a measure of the supply of the army plus the supply of US marshals or the supply of lawful authorities who would be able to use the army. Um, one easy response to that would just be that the presence is, their presence is sufficiently correlated with the army or that they're sufficiently mobile. It's not moving a lot of men around and troops around, it's just a few people. 
this is all leading up to uh, what I think is a potential, uh, I don't know if it's an appendix or extension of the paper. And that's looking at the importance of the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. So in part, I sort of want you to extend the analysis like a few more years and get army citing data just a little bit further. Because um, if it's the case that the army couldn't deploy on its own authority, but relied on US Marshal or others, and while the Posse Comitatus Act did allow the army to be used to protect voting rights, the regulations that were imposed along with it uh, said that you couldn't do it without getting presidential approval, which made it cumbersome and unlikely to happen. So you should effectively see a complete disappearance of the effect, even though you have the continued presence of the army in various places after the Posse Comitatus Act. So it'd be interesting to see whether or not you can measure or you can identify an effect of Posse Comitatus, which remains sort of a, a sort of a mystery uh, in, in a lot of this uh, literature. All right. So uh, questions about the IV. Um, I'm not entirely sure that the violation of monotonicity is unlikely. Uh, so the reason for that is, as mentioned sort of above both the troop withdrawal levels, uh, choices about overall troop levels across the country, I, I think were inevitably inter-regional choices, right? So just as an example, a famous example is that soldiers on the way to fight the indigenous nations in, in, in Indiana were sequestered in Chicago to fight striking workers. So they couldn't have the troops in Indiana because they needed them to fight uh, the, the labor strike of it. In, in Chicago, or even take the 1876 example, right? So in 1876, Congress fails to pass an Appropriations Act for the army, but they have required the deployment of cavalry to the Texas frontier. So the cavalry is gonna go to Texas, but, and that leads to its own fights because they don't want cavalry anywhere in Texas, but on the frontier, um, but the army doesn't get paid. So officers are paid by JP Morgan, enlisted men are paid by no one, but the new cavalry companies can only be created by reducing deployments elsewhere in the South, right? or reducing deployments elsewhere in the country. So that would suggest that at least at sort of a principle level, uh, violation of monotonicity seems plausible and, uh, and shouldn't be sort of dismissed off offhand. All of this is occurring as well in the context of the decline of the Republican Party everywhere, right? This is the years post-financial crisis. Um, st still, you know, ultimately I found the empirical evidence here uh, to be relatively compelling. I, I think that you should give the, the problem, take the problem a bit more seriously. Um, I do think that the empirical evidence sort of should be enough, but that I don't think it's unlikely that monocency is, is violated, but I think that it's actually relatively plausible and, and, and likely, but that you show that it probably in effect isn't. Uh, and last set of comments sort of concerns sort of the mechanisms and pathways. Um, and one concerns uh, the measure of black social networks. So I have no doubt that such networks were important. And especially if you go back to the Henry Adams quotes sort of that I started off with, he's referring to his organization, right? He's, you know that these networks mattered a lot. Uh, I do sort of have a general concern with the way we uh, interpret proxies that can proxy for a lot of different things. And large plantations could easily proxy for a lot of things that are relevant besides these networks. And so on the one hand, I think that the likelihood that black social networks matters is very, very high. The likelihood that large plantations proxy for other things that matter as much or very, uh, very much also is very high. So I think that for just one, if you have large plantations in a county with a large number of large plantations, you're gonna have fewer whites who are themselves enslave enslavers. You might have a harder time mustering a force of whites necessary, large enough, sufficient to really engage in repressing black voting. Um, and then uh, the causal pathway for protecting, uh, the causal pathway you lay out, sort of that the army presence protected turnout, protected mobilization, that leads to black representation. That makes a ton of sense. Um, and so I don't really doubt it at that level. Um, I did wonder whether or not there were other possibilities that might be worth exploring, or at the very least sort of discussing and ruling out. One is that the army presence would be conditional on violence and that this violence had a galvanizing effect on choices made by local Republicans. Right? So where there was violence, Republicans balked at any democratic efforts to coordinate or divide candidacies at sort of county levels. So sort of the type of fusion arrangements that Perman talks about in which uh, Democrats would get the state, the governor or the state and the congressional votes and a sheriff or a local official might get, might be given to the Republicans. That in counties where there is violence, you just might not get that. Um, and that that might also have induced siting choices. And another possibility is that army presence occurs very soon after sustained political organizing by blacks encounters violent resistance by whites so that you get political organizing and then army deployment to that site, it, but only to those sites that generate sort of violent resistance by whites. 
these would both be compatible with army protects that military force protects representation and induces rep representation, but it would operate through different, slightly different mechanisms. All right, so what to take away from this? Well, I think that it's kind of a commonplace in the literature that the army mattered, how it mattered, and the fact that it mattered geographically in geographic uh, diverse ways hasn't been demonstrated causally. And I think that this paper really does that. The results are wholly plausible. And the broad takeaway about the importance of state interventions to limit de facto power differentials also seems entirely right. And so I guess I'm sort of left with the uh, concern here that uh, Pulo's findings are also <laughs> right. Uh, in which case, if, if Pulo's findings are right and that you have a considerable degree of elite persistence, absent things such as uh, amnesty policies or, or uh, disenfranchisement policies, and even with those, then it seems likely that uh, state interventions to limit de facto power differentials are also gonna have a very weak foundation. Um, they're going to be constantly undermined by sort of elites. And so I guess that's where I'll leave it. That's less of a sort of a point for you, but rather a point trying to connect the two papers. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, David. So what, so why don't we first ask uh, Jason and uh, Jeff at all, if you guys have any responses to David, any thoughts? So those are uh, really great uh, comments and there's like probably too much I can respond to here, but just, um, <clears throat> You know, one point um, that's also relevant to uh, Jeff Jensen's study on using the reconstruction delegates. Um, so there's a question about um, the delegates who didn't receive amnesty, so the unamnestied, um, but who had also taken amnesty oaths. So, um, you know, this was like an issue while writing the paper. Um, there's like a lot of uncertainty in the historical literature about what actually happens in terms of um, who is allowed in these in these uh, uh, reconstruction conven conventions. But like my understanding is that you know all individuals had to take an amnesty oath, and in order to take an amnesty oath, um, you had to um, be eligible for amnesty. Um, but that didn't happen in every situation. So I have a footnote in one of the papers about how in North Carolina, the reconstruction, um, the provisional governor was like a little, um, like let in delegates who didn't qualify for amnesty. Um, so it's definitely something I have to put more effort into like untangling in the paper. So I thank you. Uh, I'll just say thanks so much for the comments. There's a lot for us to think about here. Uh, I, I won't respond to anything in, in particular. I, I I hope I can get your slides. Yeah, that's what I, I was going to. Gonna, help, I was uh, going to encourage David augment to my my many notes, but I really appreciate the comments. And uh, the only thing I'll say is that uh, I completely agree on changing the title. Thanks, <laughs> Mario. You have any thoughts at all here? Yeah, I just I just wanted to have a quick comment on the issue of uh, the railway sample. It was designed mainly to deal with the selection to the occupation, um, and and I, I I mean we sort of struggle with that. I, I think at the beginning we thought that that was a strategy to account for this key observable, which conditioned not only the location, the provision of for troops, but also the way in which they you know, exert their influence across space. So I think we could actually explore that a little bit better, trying to compare also counties that have, didn't have the railways and the troops, and that will get into maybe uh, um, some measure of influence. But I completely agree with um, with the comment that is that is both uh, an issue of the selection and an issue of the of the influence of the troops over space. So I appreciate your comments and thank you very much. And we're gonna uh, make sure that we address some of these issues. Thanks, I'm sorry we're going long, but I just wanted to make a couple of uh, comments and a question. So I really enjoyed the papers. Um, I have the question for the Jensen and Chacon et al paper. Next, I have one comment and then a, a more of a suggestion that's minor and then a question. Um, so in, in the framing, you talked about like an emerging literature on the importance of race and citing Butler and Brockman, which is a paper I like. You know, I'd go back a little bit farther. Um, there's not that much work on black descriptive representation, but you know, Jeff Jeff wrote a paper I think in the 2000s, and um, Catherine Tate's got a chapter in her book Black Faces in the Mirror where she talks 
I think, you know, maybe a page or two about Reconstruction era black representatives. It's mostly at the congressional level, so your state legislative stuff is really unique. But I think you might be able to lean on that a little bit more for justifying some of the importance and connecting it to the contemporary period. Because those, those, other than Jeff's article, the most of those books, like Catherine's, are are contemporary and the importance of black descript representation. And um, um, But that might be nice to, to connect to a little bit broader group. Carrie Haney, maybe, too. With his book in the early 2000s would probably be good on its first state legislation. But that's a, that's just a minor point. Um, I'm a fan of the Butler and Brotman piece, but I think some of the work on black descriptive representation emerged probably 30 years ago or so, um, and so that's worth mentioning. But the, my my question was more about the measure. So you look, you did. I know you had the state level measure, but you had the count of the black representatives. Um, in the state legislature, which is mostly at the county level. And this just shows my lack of knowledge of this era. But in later eras, you know, it's my understanding that, you know, big cities like Atlanta had two or three members for Fulton County and all the other rural counties had one member. You know, did you, how did you account for that? Is this, a, is there, is that an issue where your, your black representatives are getting elected in the urban areas? Yeah, um, and so then also just on, the, the on the population side, like, did you look at just 50% up in franchise blacks or black population counties um, instead of a black population continuously? And I'll just say on the last question first, only continuously. Uh, the first stuff, um, so that's a good point. We could subset it. Uh, uh, the first point is we did two measures. One is we got the apportionment. And in this period, they didn't create districts out of like half counties or whatever they were basically the counties were just assigned this apportioned a certain number of reps sometimes five sometimes but most were one the modal one is one but and we just did counts so in the year they could elect five but they could elect three they could elect one if the county was apportioned five so but we did the same thing with a ratio which would be the proportion of the counties apportioned a portion of a portion, of that, but a portion of the county's uh, reps that they're given that who were black, and the results are, are basically the same. So, and the way that those elections worked is each voter was given five votes. So usually, a party's slate would just sweep, and that's just how how those worked. So often they they would have a lot uh, if they had any. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you.